Okay, let's begin lab two for AggieCon 552. This is our, our second class meeting of the week in week five, and this will replace our, our normal meeting in class. Um, we are, we're gonna do some tutorial work. You're gonna be expected to open the software, work with it, um, follow along with, with what I do in, the, in this video, and so th that'll be facilitated better by you doing that um, wherever you can comfortably get a computer and, on a computer and work with it. Uh, let me just note the source material. So there is a, a set of notes. I think it might be named 1.5, but it may just be named um, GAMS Tutor or something like that, or Getting Started with GAMS, I think. Um, so uh, anyway, it'll be posted right next to this on the class webpage, and then the other material is GAMS Quick Start Tutorial, and here's a link uh, that'll take you to that webpage. Okay, so uh, what is GAMS? It is short for the General Algebraic Modeling System, and so uh, obviously you could go to the web documentation. This takes you to the the quick start tutorial, this link, but uh, if you look at that web page you can see the project has lots of information, the GAMS project. Um, you can read about it um, and see just what a big uh, large scale software package this is. Uh, we're only going to scratch the surface of it using it for uh, linear programming and some a few nonlinear programming exercises in this class. Um, but the, the key part of all of this is, is right here, the, um, the idea that this, this coding environment uh, comes at you with an algebraic uh, presentation. You end up writing things uh, in terms of sort of the algebraic statements. The, you're going to declare variables, you are going to write equations, and that's, that's how the, the model statements work. And so other than sort of the preparatory um, specific declarations of things uh, to, to let GAMS know how to assign things into memory and how it should be allowed to use them, um, you're going to have a big piece of, of code that just looks like a, a translatable mathematics uh, set of statements. And so that, that's useful. Um, obviously, you could be using things like uh, Perl or Python um, for, for people who are used to robust uh, coding environments and those can interpret algebra uh, pretty well as, as well um, but but this one is specific and on the back end what you're going to see is uh, once we write the equation statements we do not have to write any algorithm steps we don't have to uh, come up with sort of any um, we don't have to invoke any matrix processes or, or anything like that. Um, you know, the, the, big, the big advantage of GAMS is it has a full set of solver packages ready to run. And so once you've put together your set of equations, you just give it some instructions on your model, instructions on how to solve, and it goes, it uses its solver, and obviously that would be a, a compiled um, program uh, that takes the inputs from the compiled GAM statements that you have uh, and does all the mathematics that you uh, uh, that would be uh, useful there and so that's that's where things deviate from sort of coding this up even uh, in a Fortran or, or however um, you may have done coding uh, before um, so we will use some pieces from the tutorial uh, we're going to use our example problem uh, at least to start with, the cheap versus premium brew type. Um, but the tutorial has lots of examples. Um, when we open GAMS, the, the software, I'll show you some other examples that you can refer to. But I guess one, one of the things to point out here is that we have limited time for coding instructions. So we're going to do this lab and then I'm going to talk about GAMS in class for a little bit. Uh, maybe at least one class period, but maybe two. Um, I'm still working on the, the notes for that. 
uh, to make us better users, to see more examples, to see uh, sort of a full range uh, of, uh, of what can be done in the, in the GAMS environment. But we just do not have time to sort of flex it out and try everything. Um, you're going to have to learn some of it on your own. Um, obviously, I'm open to the idea that you may prefer one environment to the other for your model development, so Excel versus GAMS. Um, I think it is important that this class demonstrate what the advantages of GAMS are, and really it's once you start to get problems with some scale to them, uh, being able to write a compact piece of code uh, has a huge advantage over trying to specify a, a spreadsheet that will work uh, and will be easy to manage. Um, so we will get you started, but in terms of expertise, we, that is not one of our learning objectives but you should start moving in that direction if you choose GAMS for your, for your work and uh, do some self-training, ask some questions. Um, uh, I'm always glad to, to help you kind of discover the, the best uh, way to train yourself in an efficient way uh, to move that. Uh, all this is to say that I may ask for your code I may even give you feedback on it at times uh, if we have some big projects. Um, at least some kind of documentation, even if you did something in a spreadsheet, show me or write a description of what you did. Uh, but I won't be giving you grading uh, points uh, on that. Uh, but I, I do want you to be, be better. Uh, but since we don't have a learning objective of, of trying to get to a certain skill level in a certain software package, it doesn't seem fair or even... Uh, a good use of our time. Uh, we'll note that in some PhD courses and specifically AgiCon 652 as taught by Dr. Paul Preckle here in our department, uh, that is a specific learning objective and he is going to task you with um, I, I mean, in, that, in the midterm in that class. It's very very possible that you would get a question on the best way to code something uh, in GAMS. Um, okay, so the, the the games project does host this tutorial that um, I've asked you or I consider to be a source material for this and if you are working through it or looking through it really it it's a tutorial built around three types of models the first is a linear programming solution the second is putting together a set of equations that would solve for an economic equilibrium and then the third is solving a nonlinear uh, system right so some kind of uh, algorithm there to approximate uh, a Hessian, I guess. Um, we're only going to be focused on the first example, so if you were working through, t through the tutorial, you should focus on the, uh, the pieces that, that work through that first example. Okay, I have switched over uh, my web page, or sorry, my, my screen is now showing the GAMS tutorial web page where you can see the three basic models. And then here's how it's broken out. The first example is a linear program. They give you the algebraic version. Note there's an error right here. Um, that should say X cotton. But it's, it's a standard model. Three variables, um, two, two constraints that aren't non-negativity constraints. And then as you scroll, down this web page, you'll see that they give you the algebraic version, they give you uh, the GAMS model, and then as you, same thing for the second and third example, and then it goes through and, and does commentary um, to help you with that. So what does it look like to see variables? Um, what do equations look like? Model definitions, solve statements, okay? So those are the four pieces. Um, and then um, all the way through running a, the GAMS job, doing it inside the, uh, the IDE. If you keep going down, it'll show you the output, right? So what you would see as solution output, the solution report, and then down here, that'll be our next topic. So this is, um, if you were reading through this to sort of consider the, the source material stop when you get to this section called exploiting the algebraic structure. We have deliberately put together a simple problem that we could make much, much better in this first lab. And then so the, the follow on discussion of GAMS in class, we'll talk about exploiting the algebraic structure. So we'll work through that next. So 
that's sort of the scope of our talk today and I'll be doing the same thing ex as this tutorial except with our our uh, preferred problem the, the brewer um, the brewer example so I'm back in my PowerPoint here and you can see um, the, the sort of algebraic orientation if you're in the tutorial um, write down an algebraic version of the problem they do not name a, a objective variable here to be Z or R or net revenue equals this this is just the definition of the equation that's a perfectly valid way to go um, and then subject to some constraints so add up all the land allocation between corn wheat and cotton it has to be less than a hundred here are the usage requirements so every acre of corn requires six hours of labor four hours of wheat per acre uh, or sorry four hours of labor per wheat acre eight hours of labor per cotton acre uh, the total of those need to be less than 500 and then they have an algebraic misstatement here that should be x cotton so if you were to translate that um, you would get a bad result it would really be adding those two things together and you can see it's an error because they fixed it down here in the in the GAMS version but we look at these two together because we know what this is, right? We know what an algebraic uh, write-up is by now, a standard form of linear programming problem, but we don't know what this stuff is yet. And so that's that's the quick overview version here. So let's match things up. And so GAMS, before you can do anything in terms of writing these algebraic statements, remember when we were doing this in class, I asked you, or I do this on the board I usually put together a list to the side that says something like let XC or X corn be acres planted to corn X wheat be acres planted harvested and marketed of wheat something like that so we give these things descriptions so that when you look at the algebra and you see a symbol like this you know how to interpret it well GAMS needs the same thing it needs to know before it gets to the algebraic statements down here it needs to know what does it mean when you say X corn versus X wheat versus X cotton and so that's what's being done here is sort of the uh, let X sub corn be you know this variable let X sub wheat be this variable and these are the, the descriptors that um, that will match up to those and it's getting this this uh, code line called positive variables and then um, that means something distinctive it actually means the non-negativity. Uh, so these are variables that would be sub subjected to a non-negativity condition. The second declaration here is for variables, and it's Z, and that's the objective variable. Okay, and so this equation here could easily say maximize Z defined as equal to this um, sum product, sum of products here, uh, and that's how that would work and now something that's unique that we would never think about we just write subject to and start listing inequalities here to be our um, to be our um, constraints but GAMS needs labels and definitions for equations as well and so that'll be new for us and so this is just a listing right a declaration that there are going to be equations one is going to be named objective another is going to be named land and a third one is going to be named labor and you've seen me do this in class and spreadsheets I give names to um, the constraints it may just be as simple as constraint one but it may be uh, something that we call the labor constraint and so we do that that commonly and, and you can even see here that they put in parentheses out here to the side what are the names for these constraints well GAMS needs that explicitly right? so in the mathematics here if we were just solving this these have no um, no use other than to sort of remind or document us about our algebraic setup well here they're gonna have a specific use and that's saying to GAMS expect these things these objects find a memory space to hold them and then down here we get the definitions for the equations and so GAMS has a specific way it expects to see um, equations which is a a keyword in GAMS uh, that can be used to hold actual equations or inequalities okay so the objective equation OBJ 
is an actual equation. Land and labor are inequalities, uh, but they get held in the same memory type or the same uh, uh, item type in GAMS. When it comes time to declare those, give definition to these equations, we write the name of the equation, put two periods right after it. That's the signal to GAMS that what follows, so it knows what OBJ is, and then the dot dot, or the, the two periods there, are the signal to GAMS that I'm getting ready to give you the definition for this equation. And this equation is going to be defined by variables and some coefficients. Okay, so these coefficients uh, are given to us in the algebraic setup, so it's the equivalent of saying 109 times x corn plus 90 times x wheat. Um, the other piece here is this is how GAMS expects to read an equality sign. So instead of just using the equal sign, which is has a different function entirely in GAMS that we'll learn about in class, uh, it expects to see an equal sign on each side of an E to be meaning to mean uh, equals. And then over here, equal L equal, that means less than or equal to. That's how it's interpreting that. And so you can see the matchup between, uh, between all of this. We've got our objective matched up to here. We've got our constraints matched up right here. Our non-negativity constraints are actually matched up in this definition of positive variables. And then we got two other things here. Uh, a model statement and a solve statement that we'll talk about. Okay, so the coding environment, um, as you may know or may understand, is you, you give a set of instructions and they're typically just text files. Okay, so GAMS understands certain text to mean certain things. It has keywords just like just like right here, um, positive variables. That's a keyword in GAMS and it expects to see some declarations of what those things are. So you tell GAMS positive variables, it starts looking and now it's going to find that X corn, X wheat, and X cotton need memory assignments or need, you know, whatever, compiler, interpreter assignments. Um, and, and those are pieces of information. Now if you came along and said X corn uh, is defined as something different, it would change the memory type for it. Uh, you probably would get an error if you didn't uh, do a very careful job of that. And so in, these, in this coding environment or in this interpreter, it expects to see things that look like this, expects to see variables, and then a declaration that Z, and this, this um, positive variables versus variables we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. But, but a, a couple things to point out, the GAMS compiler or interpreter um, it is pretty uh, open, um, pretty flexible to how it takes in input. And so they give you three examples in the tutorial here, positive variables written in all capitals, positive variables with just an initial capital, and then positive variables not capitalized at all. And that's just letting you know that there's no case sensitivity uh, in those keywords. If it sees any iteration of those, um, it expects to see uh, listings of positive variables, listing of things, symbols that are going to be used as positive variables after that. The second thing is, what kind of input is required when you use that keyword positive variables? Well, I will typically use a variable name that I want to sign and a comma, followed by the next one, followed by the next one, with every one of those separated by a comma, and then a semicolon used to terminate uh, that keyword. Um, it turns out GAMS is flexible here too. It doesn't care if you switch between capital X C O R N and lowercase x c o r n. It doesn't care if you move the second variable declaration to a new line. And in fact, it's so flexible that you could put x corn on one line and x wheat on the next line, and you can just skip the comma. So an end of line, right? So uh, this sort of new line input uh, going from one line to the next is the equivalent of reading a comma to GAMS. So that means it knows once it starts hitting a new line input um, that it needs to start a new variable assignment. So all three of these are equivalent. Um, I think it's good practice to pick one and stick with it. And so I think the easiest one to follow along with, especially in our little demonstration models, is this uh, set of um, 
uh, commas. And it's true that uh, GAMS uh, has some flexibility uh, for ease of mind. When you end a statement in GAMS, put a semicolon after it. Uh, that is a guaranteed termination uh, of the expected behavior uh, that's going on. Uh, there are some places where you don't need the uh, semicolon at the end of the line, but for now, uh, and, and just as good practice, uh, people expect to see those. Okay, so if we were to, to sort of step back and think about what is an overview of the basic GAMS model setup, we start with declarations typically do as many of those at the top of the page or the top of the input file, the, the, the code, uh, as possible. A computer needs definitions. Those are names or symbols. They're, they're declared to be a specific data type or algebraic type. GAMS probably calls them um, specific data types and it probably allocates to them a memory location that's specific to their data type. And if you start violating what can be used, how that can be used, or what can be stored in there, it'll start giving you errors. Um, and so in these simple models, we shouldn't have any trouble, um, but you get into more complicated situations that you can might imagine where you're using something as a variable in one space and then using it as some fixed parameter somewhere else in a, a second uh, piece of the code, uh, then you could hit some problems. Uh, in terms of naming, GAMS has flexibility in how you name things. It's common to use names and symbols that are document documentation type. So something like capital X C O R N is X maybe is your sort of internal, uh, you know, your personal documentation to, to for naming variables. C O R N just tells you which uh, version of the X variable you're looking at. GAMS has robust documentation facilities, so there's lots of ways to put inside the code documentation of what you're doing. We won't in introduce those until a little later. Once we have all our declarations, we can use them in expressions, okay, so mathematical expressions, equations or inequalities, and um, so that's where the equation type comes in. And We said already that equation, the keyword in GAMS means you're looking at equations or inequalities. Um, Beyond that, once you have equations and variables named, you can declare a model. Okay, and a model is a specific set. Uh, so, if equations give you relationships, then models, the model statement or the model type in GAMS, the model, um, the model item, is a collection of relationships. Okay, and so a system. Uh, is probably the easiest way to think about it. a system of equations and inequalities all get collected together in a model and then that once you have declared a model then you can start giving solve instructions right so you tell GAMS here's my model it consists of equation 1 2 and 3 those equations themselves define the relationship between vari variables in the model and then that model holds all the information so that then can be said to have a solve instruction. So that model, you tell GAMS to solve it, you tell it what type of model, what classification it should have, um, and then uh, it will pick the best solver or you can you can actually instruct it on which solver you want working. And uh, and that's, that's everything. That's a basic GAMS uh, setup. Okay, we have uh, um, we're going to keep using the same problem. There's some value in using the same problem over and over when we're learning new techniques because we already know the solution. Uh, yeah, I understand if you're tired of seeing the cheap versus premium brew problem, I'm also tired of it. But, um, you know, I, I think that's an error. I think this is from chapter one, example two. Oh, yeah, so here it, the title says. Um, anyway, remember we have two activities. They each have a different profit per unit. They have different resource units. Uh, sorry, resource usage rates, and we have these three constraints on a production line. So uh, that's our problem setup. Putting together the pieces uh, from GAMS, we would have to do decide in this setup in the Kaiser Messer uh, Brewer problem what are going to be the positive variables. 
anything we do positive variable for will be a non negative have a non negativity constraint implied for it. What's going to be the free variable? <coughs> In a linear program, the um, the objective variable must be a free variable. It can't have any uh, it can't have any boundaries. So when we say um, variables in, in GAMS that the implication is that it's a free variable it can take on any value on the number line you can also write the statement free variable so in our model so far the the Brewer problem we would have the two choice variables be positive variables the net return to the Brewer to the decision maker would be a free variable and then in the equations those are the declarations of relationship between variables and parameters um, we would have our three constraints. They're all going to be of this type. In GAMS, this is what it expects to see between the left-hand side and the right-hand side for something that's written as a less than or equal to constraint. Uh, and then we would have one equation that looks like this, the objective equation that calculates the returns uh, on the production plan. So, uh, and just to finish this out, when you have a greater than or equal to constraint, expect to see equal g equal. And then we would need a model statement, a model statement that collects our equations, right, the three constraints and the objective equation. Um, and, uh, and then we would need to, uh, once we get that model type built, uh, give us some solve instructions. Okay. So we are ready to, to get into GAMS just a little bit. Um, the software is uh, not free, but it is free to use the demo version. And we are in a teaching class, so we're going to have small versions of the model. And um, you can go and download it right now. So if you're on an Ag Econ uh, machine uh, at work, you probably already have GAMS on your computer, whether you've opened it or not. So you can search for it, just search on GAMS, see if you can find a folder, uh, and you may already have it installed. Uh, if not, you can go to gams.com slash download, and you'll get to the download page. Okay, for those of you that maybe um, don't have this already, uh, here's what the GAMS download page looks like. So you can see they have a 32-bit compile, compile version, a 64-bit uh, compile version. So you probably need to check your Windows type. I guess 32-bit um, runs on both, but I'm not sure. Um, you probably have a 64-bit machine if you're running anything relatively recent. Um, that's the type of Windows environment that lets you use more RAM than 4 gigabytes. So most of those are 64-bit now and this would be the one you want to download. If you're running uh, Ubuntu or something, uh, which I run at home, uh, you might want this one if, if it's on your personal computer or something. Uh, it runs the same, it's all the same build um, and so forth. So let's slide down to the notes and you'll see what the limits are. So if you run GAMS with no license, it runs as a free demo system number of constraints and variables must be less than 300, number of non-zero elements um, 2,000, and number of discrete variables 50. That's a big, those are big, uh, I mean they're not, they're not very big, but they are big compared to, um, uh, to the kind of teaching uh, examples we're going to use in this class. So uh, we shouldn't hit that in this class. If we do, uh, we will make sure that we uh, distribute uh, class licenses that get us around those. So I'm going to click on download here just to see what happens. Um, okay, so you would have to agree to the license agreement. This is a trusted thing. You can see I've already downloaded it, um, so I'm not going to do that. But what you'll want to do is then run it, and it'll ask you if you want to run, uh, install the something called the GAMS IDE environment for running uh, software. Um, so maybe I should just do those steps just so we can see it. Whoops, I got the wrong version, didn't I? Let's go there, download, uh, save. 
Hopefully I won't mess up my computer too much here. So it's downloading with a few seconds to go. Okay. Click on that, it'll try to run. Okay, it's not going to let me show you that because GAMS is already running on my machine. Um, and I, I can't risk corrupting uh, my installation. Um, but anyway, it's a it's a straightforward Windows install. It installs using the Windows Platform Installer. Uh, the only option that you have to, to choose is that GAMS IDE. And the reason we want to use that is because, um, well, it's a pretty nice environment. Um, so when you get the software, um, I'm oh, sorry, uh, let me just point out, if you're on a uh, Purdue machine, ITAP and AgIT have whitelisted GAMS, so it's supposed to be something you can install without any administration privileges. If you hit a problem there, you need to talk to whoever administers computers in your, in your unit. Um, so whether it's, uh, so for us, it's AgIT in the College of Agriculture. If you're in a different college, you could be dealing with ITAP or something specific to your college. Um, but if they have taken away the whitelisting of this, you'll need to contact them. Usually a, uh, a dialog opens up where you can send them a direct message um, and they'll see what you're trying to install and then what they'll do is they'll call you and take over your machine. They'll remotely access your machine and install it for you. And then you can just say this class is the reason you're installing it. Okay, so that the reason we want this uh, GAMS IDE, it looks like it'll. I think it'll all be one word when you see it um, on your computer. So it looks like it says GAMS side. You can see right there where this is open. So it says GAMS side, and you can see where it's located. Um, so, yeah, so this IDE is, I don't, I'm not sure what this is. I think it's Interactive Development Environment or something like that. Uh, but what it is is it's this own platform or this, this architecture um, that lets you go and open GAMS code and run GAMS models and get the output all in these different window panes that will open up inside of this, this um inside this development environment okay GAMS is a language you can write a GAMS program just in any text file and then process it with GAMS compiler and then execute it as a GAMS executable and it'll write a text file of output that you could go read but if you use this environment all that stuff gets done in the background you never have to go to the command line um, it has a built-in text editor and reader here inside this environment, so everything is opening. You know, you never have to go and find the new file and open it. It's always giving it to you. It has a button press run, right? So when we actually put a model together, this little button right here will turn red, and you press that, and it also it does the compiling and then execution uh, all in one shot, so you never have to go and give separate statements uh, on the command line or anything like that. And then when you solve, it'll open up a, it'll have your text file of, of instructions here, your code, and then to the right of it, it'll open up a new text file that has the solution. So you're able to, to go back and forth. Uh, it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to teach. Uh, it's also good for model development. It, it may have some drawbacks if you ever got into this um, seriously in, in the profession. Um, you know, uh, for one, a lot of people don't like the text editor you're required to use in GAMS, so uh, if you want to use a separate one, you either have to port it uh, over to the GAMS IDE or um, leave the IDE be behind and, and use uh, command line instructions. So, But for now, we're going to do everything in GAMS IDE. And um, yeah, so that's we're ready. We're ready to get into it. So um, our first GAMS model. Um, if you open the gamside.exe file, so navigate to wherever um, GAMS was installed on your computer, go inside the directory, uh, I think it'll be GAMS uh, 
25.1, something like that, and you'll find gamside.exe. If not, just search on Windows, gamside.exe. It'll give you the file and the location. Open that in that environment that looks like this page. will open for you, and it'll say it'll have this splash page. You can go to File, and then when you hit File, it'll say Open, and I'm going to do all this for you so you can watch. Uh, and you'll navigate to the downloaded the file you downloaded for this class brew underscore demo one underscore aggie comp 552.gam so this is the extension for gams uh, programs and when you install gams uh, windows part of the installation is that windows now recognizes gam gms files uh, as gams files when you open that you'll see the full code for our brewers primal problem so we've just begun our work with primal and dual problems we're going to run the primal problem um, I'm going to discuss the pieces of that code I'm going to look at the output of that GAMS model with you we'll run a, a couple of experiments in this lab and we'll also write code for the dual and run it in that same GAMS file so these are all the things we're going to do in this lab um, also there's a set of notes that handout that goes with this you'll see it on the lab materials page uh, so you can read through that as well, looking at the um, my notes and discussion of the GAMS model components. Okay, unfortunately, like a lot of things, when I capture my screen, things get very small looking. Uh, so it's hard for you to see uh, some of these. So maybe you, you have to increase your uh, screen or... or focus on part of the screen but I'll, I'll say what I'm what what these things mean and hopefully you have uh, open GAMS IDE on your uh, machine as well so you can see these things um, as they appear in, in your uh, installation um, so our first step is just going to be to open that text or that GAMS file so we're gonna go to file open and then I'm going to navigate you would want to navigate through this drop down to wherever you um, installed the brewer demo and I'm and that's where this uh, my machine uh, is taking me to uh, this brewer example files directory so wherever you download this file brew demo one agicon 552.gams that's what you want okay so just click on open and then you get the text file the text editor in GAMS opens it here, and this is our this is our code. Um, this is our model for that Brewer problem. So here are the right hand sides. Here are the objective coefficients. Um, but first, remember GAMS expects to see some declarations, and so that's how we start. Uh, I will start up here, I guess. So the the first thing up here is um, a couple of uh, keywords. And these are just basically keywords to GAMS. They're, they're called dollar prompts, I think. Um, so dollar sign with the word on text after it means I need to write some text up here. And keep interpreting anything I write now as just plain text until you get to this other dollar prompt that says dollar off text. So it's basically turn on text writing, turn off text writing. And once you get past the off text, these things are now... Um, statements that the GAMS interpreter should be reading for um, GAMS types. Okay, it should be trying to interpret these. It doesn't interpret anything in between dollar on text and dollar off text. And so that's where you write sort of a description or any notes to your model. And I've just put simple brewer problem from chapter one. Okay, and so we'll do that. You'll see those uh, in lots of things. Um, it's, it's, a, it's the common documentation step uh, that happens here. So our first thing to do though is declare our variables. So we've got some positive variables that we would have non-negativity constraints attached to. And I'm going to use Q for my signal of a quantity. And we'll have two types, two quantity variables. One is the cheap brew and the second one is the premium brew. Okay, so Q cheap and Q premium. Everywhere we, the GAMP sees those, I want it to recognize that that's me using the variable if it shows up in an equation then it's um, that means I'm describing a relationship between that variable and some other pieces of the model 
And then for the just variables declaration, these are the free variables, that's where I'm going to put my objective variable R. Okay, so the return, uh, uh, you know, net return or whatever, but it's R is the return. Uh, so that takes care of all the variable declarations. We only have three in this model. And then we need the equations, and we'll have four of those. So we need an equation for the objective, and then I've got my boundaries or my constraints that I'm just going to name B1, B2, and B3. Okay, so the objective um, is an equality. The B1, B2, and B3 are all less than or equal to constraints. Remember those definitions? Wait, I'm oh, sorry. This is the this is the declaration step here, and now we need the definitions. So the definition for the objective, we put the equation name followed by two dots, and then Gams knows everything next is going to be um, the stuff that comes next is the definition for that equation. So R, the objective variable is exactly equal to, that's what this equal sign E equal sign means. Q cheap, which this is a coefficient of 1, 1 times Q cheap plus 2.5 times Q premium. That's our objective equation. And then our constraints are the same, right? So we need the name of the constraint, two dots, and then coefficient times variable plus coefficient times variable, and then our sign, less than or equal to, and then we'll put the right hand side. So, 3 times Q cheap plus 3 times Q premium, less than or equal to 50. That's how we read that. Um, yeah, so every time at the end of lines or end of um, input, so positive variables, put them in, and then end with a semicolon. The declaration of variables ends with a semicolon. Declaration of equations, end it with a semicolon. The objective equation, end it with a semicolon. Each of the constraints, I'm ending with a semicolon. Okay, so I'm using semicolons everywhere. Um, it's very possible that there are steps where you can skip those. Uh, I prefer them, and uh, I will always use them. And um, if you want to know lots of things about GAMS and learn what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do, click on Help. And here's GAMS documentation online. Here's a set of GAMS documentation offline, and then. A former Purdue professor wrote something called the Expanded GAMS Guide. His name is Bruce McCarl. He's now a Texas A&M professor um, and maybe an emeritus professor by now, but uh, he was at Purdue uh, back in the day and uh, he is a, a GAMS master. He is very involved in the GAMS development uh, as part of that team for economics. And uh, yeah, he's written a, a nice guide all about implementing stuff. Okay, this is the simple part. This is the stuff we've seen a couple times now, these declarations and definitions. So now we need a new type, and that's the model statement. So we've never had to do anything like this before. It's sort of equivalent to when in Excel when you open the solver parameters, um, and then you're, de you're required to go back to your spreadsheet and list the changing variables, and you're required to list the uh, equations or the constraints in a specific spot and and to declare which is your objective well that's the equivalent of this right and as part of that you're also required to choose a solve method and so that's the second part of this so the stuff down here is most akin to that that solver parameters or, or the solver dialog box that we use in Excel um, so, model is a keyword in GAMS. Brew is the name I'm going to give to the model. So this is a, a, just like the variable here is R, the model here is called brew. And then we need a specific way of putting in equations. So you get this, I don't know if it's a forward slash or a backslash, but that type of slash opens and closes uh, or bounds the listing of equations. So objective equation, B1, B2, and B3 all sit in between those two slashes and then a semicolon. And that's the model statement. So it's saying take all four of these equations and put them in my model. If you leave one out, then the model, right, you could have another equation declared here that says B4 um, B4 
before the fourth equation, it would need to be added up here as before. It needs to be a declaration and a definition for it. it would say q cheap, that's a positive variable. It's a non negative variable, and that's how we would write it in GAMS. And if we added that in here, it would be a new constraint to the system, and GAMS would treat it like a constraint. But GAMS already has a built in constraint for this, we don't need it. And so we could actually have this equation defined up here, but solve this model here, and it would only use the equations that are given here, the only ones that are listed here. So why is that nice? Well, you might have a system where you want to try you know, seven or eight constraints, but you may not want to use all the constraints every time, especially if you had something like a policy constraint. Uh, so there was some kind of like wheat allotment that limits um, uh, that limits how much land can be planted to wheat on a farm, right, for some kind of wheat program that you have to set aside some amount. Well, you want to solve one model with the wheat allotment in, the constraint, the policy constraint saying how much wheat you're allowed to grow, and then solve a second model uh, without that. Um, or a more direct example might be something like this where you copy one of the constraints exactly except changing the right hand side to 26 and so you know from our classwork that one of the things we can do is increase the right hand side by one and get an estimate of um, the shadow price from there and so in one model statement you might use B3 for the right hand side and then the next model statement you might use B4 and swap it in for B3. And so that's two different models. The only constraint that's changing is really the constraint on the quality control, right? And the right hand side is changing. And so those would give you two different ways. Um, so write all the equations once, change the model statement, solve each of those, and then you've got a, something you can directly compare. Okay, I'm taking all those out now. I think I've, I've covered that well enough. We've got our model statement, so GAMS will know what a model uh, what the model is, and then it just needs a solver instruction. All right, so solve, also a keyword, tell it what to solve, brew, and then it's got some keywords here, using LP, okay, and so this could be using some other uh, thing. So these are keywords or reserve words in GAMS using LP. We'll use this over and over and over, so we're not going to get into what are the alternatives here, and then tell it what you want to do with it. We want to maximize, and then it needs to know what's the objective variable. So solve this model right above here using LP, linear programming, maximizing R. And so this is a specific statement of GAMS um, that, that points it uh, to what we're trying to do. Um, OK, another sort of benefit of using the GAMS IDE or the text editor here inside of this uh, as all these blue bolded items to the left here. So positive variables, variables, equations, model, those are all in bold and in blue. And there's a reason, solve as well. It's because those are reserved or keywords in GAMS and so one of the things it does is if it knows the GAMS, it knows the list, all the GAMS keywords, um, and it gives you those when you're typing them, right? So if you move down here and you just start typing variable, when you get to the end, right? So now it's not bold. When you get to the end, um, you know that you've typed it in, and it, it changes color, and it's a key, and you know you've just typed a GAMS keyword. Um, if you type variable wrong, it won't turn blue, and that'll be a great way for you to notice a, a typo that you've made. You can actually control the behavior of those going to File and Options, and I believe it's called Colors. Yeah. And so over here in Colors, it lets you describe uh, how GAM syntax items uh, gets used. And so you could even do for yourself, um, you could even put in your own um, sort of uh, key items, right? So when something pops up, you can define it give it specific colors so that it shows up. So that if you wanted something like solve to show up with like 
br uh, bold green or bold yellow or bold orange, whatever, you could change the color and change the way that behavior works. Um, I've never, never worked with any of that. We have another thing here. When you put a, an open slash um, in here and then start putting GAMS items in between, it turns it to green, right? And it's setting that apart because it knows this is a GAMS list. It's a list of GAMS elements uh, that are supposed to be used in a certain way. And so that's what's, uh, what's going on there. Okay, I think we've got everything covered here. We got all of our code. This up here is just a comment. We're ready to run. Let's see what we get out of this. Okay, so you click on this button here. That's the run GAMS, or you could hit F9. And it does one step compile, two step execute, and it keeps going. You get all this information. You'll see it's reading the data. It's starting Cplex. That's its solver. Um, all this information, not too interesting, but it does have sort of a dual uh, uh, simplex approach here for finding the solution in a bounds out of bounds and um, you can see what's going on here it's swapping in first Q premium second Q cheap and then finally uh, B1 slack is the sort of key that it's working off of um, okay so that's the the sort of um, log statements so that's what we call the log file for GAMS let me get out of that go over here these are the more interesting things. So it's called the list file. So this is our code in the first tab, and the second tab is called the list file. And so this it starts with compilation. It gives you what we call the echo print. So it's going to list everything that we coded in, and then it's going to start here with some things called column. And you can see how GAMS is solving this. Okay, so you can work through here and that negative one for the objective, negative 2.5 for the objective. Uh, if those don't look familiar, well, we haven't had a lot of practice with simplex method, um, but that's what's going on there. If you scroll down to model statistics, um, that this is just telling you um, how many equations and variables you have, right? So GAMS is building out a matrix, so to speak. Um, it's counting up how many non-zero elements are there and of course the demo license has limits on each of these that we could hit if we had a bigger problem um, and then the next thing over here and these are all clickable hyperlinks okay so this is what you would call like a table of contents for the list file it knows um, the different components that are in there and so we go straight down to the solution report and so when you get to the solution report you get something that starts with the solve summary here and here are just the, uh, the basics. So the model was called Brew. It was a linear programming type. And the solver it used was Cplex. So that's just the default solver. Um, we don't need to know anything about that. The objective variable was R. The direction was to maximize. And that solve statement came on line 19 of the original code. Then you get the status report here. So one means normal completion. That's a code. If you got an abnormal completion, it would be two or some other number and then it's also optimal and you might get some other number here if it was non-optimal if it failed to find a solution or whatever and then it reports the objective value so the objective value comes in at 22.5 and we knew that was going to be the case um, after the sol solution report you get the solver equations and the solver variables okay so here's an, an equation listing uh, and a variable listing if I just kept scrolling you would get the equation listing here and each of these comes um, with a reporting of the lower the upper the level and the marginal okay and so we already know what these are this is like in our Excel sheets the upper is the upper boundary there is no lower boundary on these constraints and then the level is just what was the evaluation of the left hand side so 45 versus 50 we know that's the slack and then here we have 40 versus 40 25 versus 25 and a marginal attached to those 0.25 and 0 0.500 um, yeah so that gives us um, that gives us the shadow presses on those two constraints 
okay, so that GAMS is automatically solving for the shadow prices or the marginal uh, without us having to do anything more. So those are the dual variables uh, as we've come to call them in our most recent class. And then down here, if you go right below, you get the solver variables. Um, you get a lower and an upper for these, and the lower bound here is this period, and that period stands for zero. Okay, so one of the most unfortunate things about GAMS is when it's reading data and it gets the value to be zero for something um, or null, <laughs> then it reads it as a period. Okay, and so when you're reporting output, one of the things that will frustrate you is the solution values that show up as zero. We don't have any of those here, but if a variable was optimally set to the value of zero, um, like the marginal here, it shows up as a period, and you have to have some way of, of dealing with that and substituting in a zero. Um, okay, so the marginal here would show up if there was a um, reduced cost or, or objective penalty or really shadow price on the non-negativity constraint. And then here's the solution value for the objective variable. So 10 items of Q cheap, 5 items of Q premium, and the objective is 22.5. And here's the report summary. You get zeros. These are codes. Zero non-optimal, zero infeasible, zero unbounded. It had zero instances of all of these. And that's, that's really how a GAMS model works. Okay, we're not going to leave this lab without coding in our own um, uh, new problem. So we're going to stay in the same code, and you can see I've already done this, but I'm going to uh, move over here and, and, and work, let you follow along with me. Um, and you can find the code that we're going to enter into our, our model um, in, the, uh, in the PowerPoint slides um, if you need a, a reference as you follow along. But we're going to set up and solve the dual um, of the Brewer's problem. Okay, so we've just started working with dual models. That seems like a good thing to try out. And so let's add it uh, over here. And so if you want to, um, the PowerPoint, the last um, page of the PowerPoint is the GAMS exercise code the dual. It has all the, uh, all the lines you need to input. If you want to pause this and just go ahead and type them in. Um, but I'm going to uh, hopefully uh, uh, be able to quickly get those uh, in. Um, for you here. So um, okay, so uh, we should always I uh, like to put in some uh, some name. So that's our, our indication that um, that we're, we're doing some new problem down here, so some new uh, documentation. Uh, we have a few steps we need to do. We could just go up here and treat it as a template. So positive variables, we're going to need some new ones of those, some new positive variables because we're going to have to put the dual variables in, the shadow process. Um, in terms of the objective, what's the objective for the dual? Well, it turns out it's the same thing, so we don't need a new variable declaration there. Um, we are going to need all new equations though, right? Because the objective equation, even though the objective variable is the same, the definition of it um, in the dual is not the same as in the primal problem. And then of course the constraints are different as well, so we'll need new versions of that. So I'm going to, to keep the, uh, the coding, um, the, the, sorry, the amount of time you spend watching me type uh, at a minimum, I am going to cut and paste, or I'm going to actually pause the video while I type in some things so you don't have to watch that, um, but I'll put them in one at a time. Okay, I've added my new positive variables. I'm just going to go with R1, R2, and R3. Those are my three shadow prices. They match up to B1, B2, and B3. Uh, first constraint, second constraint, third constraint. 
For the new equations, I need a new objective, and I'm just going to call that equation D OBJ, the dual objective. It's going to have a different definition. And then for the new constraints, I'm just going to call those V1 and V2. Those are the those are the constraints that match up to variable one and variable two's um, uh, pricing. Okay, so it's going to the equations are going to be now um, defined by our objective variable coefficients, and so that's how I'm going to use those. So the first one will have a right hand side of one. The second one will have a right hand side of 2.5. Okay, let's add some more pieces. Okay, we need uh, have all of our declarations, positive variables, equations. We need definitions for the equations. How do the variables relate? And you can see here we have R1, R2, and R3 as the variables, so they end up in all of these equations. The coefficients in the objective, right, need to match up the right hand side of the constraints from the primal. So we've got 50, 40, and 25, right? Those match up. And then the coefficients in the dual constraints should be the transpose right of the coefficients from up here and so the way to read this is three two one or the first column here they should be the coefficients in the first row down here so three two and then one and then up here three four and three the second column be the second row three four and three and then the right hand side are just the objective coefficients one and 2.5 from down there. Okay, so we got our equations defined. Now we just need to define the model. So we got a model keyword, and I'm going to call this model brew dual, right? We need the three equations. This is a three equation model because uh, the dual has one less constraint than the primal, uh, it has one extra variable, right? And so in between those brackets, I'll have my dual objective, V1 and V2 constraints. And then we'll have a solve statement or a solve instruction. Solve brew dual using the same thing. And then, of course, be sure that you convert to minimization. Right? So the dual takes the opposite direction uh, of the primal, but the variable is the same. We're going to maximize, or sorry, uh, use R for the optimized variable, but we're going to make it as small as possible. All right, I think that should do it. Uh, hopefully this runs. And so we could just, a uh, cool thing here, if you've got a bunch of stuff but only one model <coughs> that you want to run, um, we'll, we'll test it and see if it works. Uh, usually, if the variables are all known and declared, you can just highlight part of your code and click on the run item, and that worked. Okay. Now the only reason that worked is because I have variable declarations um, already for R and I'd already run it once before. If you just open this as a new file and the first part of the code had never been run before, um, up here, if we hadn't already run this during this session, R wouldn't be in memory as a variable and it wouldn't have worked, but it did work here. So. Uh, let's go to brew uh, demo one list and it's added to the listing here and let's go down to the solve variables we get R, R1, R2, and R3 and we have it all right here okay and so we've got a dual solution it gives us the same objective variable R2 is the shadow price on constraint 2 0.25 shadow price on constraint 3 0.5 uh, and R1, sure enough, uh, comes in at a value of zero. Okay, and that zero is replaced with a dot. You can see both constraints were binding and the marginals return to us the objective, uh, sorry, the, the variable levels from the primal problem of 10 and 5. Okay, with that, I think you have some lab instructions to go through, uh, some exercises to run uh, using your your new GAMS model that we've made in this class and played with. Um, so do those uh, exercises. There's a quiz online uh, that you'll need to use um, to get, uh, uh, sorry, that you can use to record um, your answers uh, to some of those exercises as well. Uh, with that, I'm going to shut down here and start compiling this for you.